Hey everybody, welcome to Life is Brutal. I'm Anthony and today we're going to be doing another episode of This Week in Beer. The segment of my channel where we go through and we talk about some of the best, hardest hitting news stories coming out of beer, beer culture, industry, discussions, that type of stuff, you know what I mean? News. Alright, so this first story is a bit interesting in my opinion. And it's coming out of Massachusetts where we're going to talk about pay to play and bribery. Now if this feels a bit like deja vu, well that's because Earlier this year, I've already talked about a bribery case coming out of Massachusetts. And actually, last year, I talked about it twice. And I think in recent memory, there's been a total of like five incidents of pay-to-play bribery lawsuits going on in Massachusetts, specifically around Boston. So it doesn't really seem like that fair of a market. Anyways, earlier this week, the Supreme Court of Massachusetts found that a craft beer distributor was guilty of violating pay-to-play laws, which is a drastic step away from what we've seen in the past because all those other incidents always were revolved around big beer and usually Anheuser-Busch in particular. So it's odd to see craft beer getting thrown into the dirty, dirty dirt. The distribution company is known as the Craft Brewers Guild, so that's a bit confusing. I don't want to confuse everybody because that makes them think about the actual Brewers Guild, you know, in that area. So I'm just going to call them the CBG from here on out. The CBG was found guilty of incentivizing retailers to go with their line of products through a series of bribes in the form of kickbacks. So the kickbacks were like discounts. You know, I'm giving you a discounted price on this keg in order for you to choose it over your competitor. So you're not spending your own money. So it's not a direct upfront bribe where I'm like, hey, do what I want while I throw money at you. It's more like, hey, I'm offering you such a good deal. Now, the state's investigation did find that these kickbacks were pretty egregious. We're looking at anywhere between $2,000 off annually per line that you are dedicating to the CBG. And over the past five years, that's actually equaled up to $120,000 at a minimum. That's just what was provable. To make things worse, the CBG went extraordinarily out of its way to try to cover up its tracks, basically proving that it knew what it was doing was wrong. It built up a whole bunch of shell corporations and businesses underneath it that would handle all the actual sales and everything, but it had zero employees on the books. And basically it was just a way for the shell companies to take the fall without any real backlash coming back on the CBG. Because of these egregious offenses, we are looking at the biggest fine to ever come out of this region for pay to play violations. We're looking at $2.1 million fines as well as a suspension of a liquor license. On the other side of the coin, we see a retailer who had to go through the Supreme Court and who also got their ruling this week. And they were being accused of taking illegal bribes, the kickbacks from the CBG. Rebel restaurants had been accepting these kickbacks for quite a long time now, but they were actually found innocent in this situation, whereas the CBG was found guilty. Rebel made an argument that revolves around the fact that as a retailer who is just accepting the products from the distributors, when they have a designated number of lines, you know, they can only have like, let's just say 10 lines, you know, and you got three, four, maybe more distributors all fighting for those 10 lines, obviously you're going to take the best deal. And if it isn't implicitly stated that, oh, this is a bribe to only carry my products, you know, if they're just like, hey, I got the best deal and I'm going to continue giving the best deals, then obviously you're going to go with that person, you know, you're running a business, you got to make the money, got to save the money, you know, where the CBG was found guilty of giving the same products to different places for different prices, like where they'd go up and be like, hey, I'm selling this one for $10 and some people might accept it. If someone's like, ah, it's not a good enough deal, they'd be like, well, for you, I'll make a special offer, you know, that's illegal. But for a retailer, unless they specifically say for you, you know, you don't really know. If they just come up and be like, hey, here's this price and it's way below what other people are offering, yeah, you're going to take it. And you're not going to know what that price is for other people. So because of the ambiguity of the law and because of the massive gray area in the retailer's knowledge of what the distributor's businesses practices are, 
they were found innocent, which I actually agree with. Because if you have so many people fighting for your lines and you don't know that the operation that they're running is illegal, you are just a victim. You're getting wrapped up in someone else's game. You know, you're just trying to practice capitalism by taking the best deal that the market is offering you. And it just sucks that a lot of people got rolled up into this, you know, and maybe not, maybe didn't know what was happening. So the aftermath of this case is extremely interesting. One, this CBG, this distributor, they're owned by a much bigger company that owns distribute like 19 or so different distributors throughout the New England area. So it's very likely that this could become a federal case. And it's very likely that if this one place in particular is practicing it, it's probably happening elsewhere. And going through a lot of the comments in Reddit and uh, people who are speaking out about this, they said that this is actually extremely commonplace within craft beer specifically. Like, not only do we have to compete with big beer for taps and availability in stores and retailers and things like that, but also craft has started edging into that nefarious, underhanded tactic area as well. They're getting down in the dirt with them. Which I think this case really held up a mirror to craft beer and allowed them to take a deep look at themselves. We're, we're becoming a big beer entity, basically. You know, when you have a retailer who is supported by some of the biggest names in the game, Yingling, Sierra Nevada, Lagunitas, all of them, you are complicit and they are complicit because I highly doubt that those producers don't know that their product is being sold at a drastic undercut. And that means that this big virtuous David versus Goliath concept, this image that we paint ourselves in as a community, it's not all that anymore, you know? And maybe it never was. So it definitely caused a lot of introspection within the community, at least for me, you know? I really started thinking, how far have we fallen and what have we become? Did we live long enough to become the villain? I don't know, it really doesn't paint us in the best light, so. I don't know, just an interesting little story. So let me know what your thoughts are. I know that I have some people in uh, the comments section who work in retail and work in distribution. And I would love to know what y'all's opinions are on this. I know it varies state by state what the actual laws are and what the limits and the regulations are. So please sh shed some light on me. I'm very interested in that. So moving on to beers that were announced or released this week, we got Two very interesting ones. First up, we got some great news coming out of Colorado. Coors Brewing has announced that they are going to re-release Batch 19 Prohibition Lager. Now, if you've never had Batch 19, you might be wondering, why is that so exciting? Why are you so hyped up for something coming out of big beer, out of Coors? Well, if you've ever had Batch 19, you know that it's probably one of the best big beer offerings that have ever been released. Even though by today's standards, it is classified as an American adjunct lager. It has a very interesting story and very bold and interesting flavors. Batch 19 was, as it sounds, the 19th batch that was ever brewed by Coors. And when Prohibition started, they took the recipe, they threw it down in the basement and basically forgot about it for decades. And at some point several years ago, there was a flood in that basement. They had to go take all, everything out and bring it upstairs to protect it from being waterlogged and all that stuff. And while they were going through it, they found a notebook that had several of Core's earliest recipes to include batch 19. Anyways, the point is, I think it's a really good beer. You know, if you're looking for a nice, simple, easy to drink beer, like a lawnmower beer, or just like something to take to a party or barbecue or something like that, Batch 19 was a solid offering, and I was really sad when they did away with it, but I'm so happy that they're bringing it back. The downside is it's only going to be a Colorado-specific release. But I will always remain the optimist, and I do believe that uh, if there is enough well reception and if people like it enough, we might be able to see it re-released on a wider distro. But here's what I'm actually more excited for. I have a dream that not only will Batch 19 come back around because I do think Batch 19 is an important part of American beer history. You know, it's a lost form of beer media, basically. And I hope that if it does get well enough reception in Colorado and it does see that nationwide distro, hopefully Coors will release those other two lost 
recipes that they had in that notebook. They did mention several years ago in an interview that they would be willing to go ahead and brew that stuff if batch 19 was received well enough. So it didn't happen then, obviously, since it was taken away, but it was a fan favorite and people were clamoring for it. They wanted it back and it came back. So here's a second chance. Don't think about it as supporting big beer. Think about it as supporting beer history. The second release I want to talk about this week has less to do with beer and more to do with whiskey, but it all revolves around Pabst Brewing, which makes it all that much more interesting. It appears that Pabst, the big, big boy Pabst, you know, with the blue ribbon, they're going to be branching into craft whiskey. And in an even more interesting twist, Pabst is partnering with New Holland Brewing up in Michigan. New Holland, they have a line of spirits of their own, which if you've had some of their spirits, I wouldn't necessarily recommend that to be the best partnership to make your spirit. Anyways, not a whole lot of information has been released on this whiskey as of yet, but there was a label that was released onto the internet and it did give us a little glimpse into some of the details that are be going on around this whiskey. And a lot of questions were raised because of it. Apparently it is not going to be a subsidiary. It will fly under the the banner of the Paps Blue Ribbon. It additionally says it's gonna be produced by Jacob Best, who was the original founder of what would eventually become Paps Brewing. So that's interesting since, you know, he's been dead for forever. But the weirdest and most interesting bit of intrigue or mystery is uh, on the label, it says that this whiskey was aged for five seconds. I'm not sure what they're going for with the five seconds. Also, I'm not sure what they're aging it in. Is it virgin oak? Is it um, used spirit barrels? Beer barrel? I don't know. I'm, I'm just interested what they're going for with this. Definitely an interesting story and a little bit of an odd concept to most people, but I do think that this is the next natural progression that we're going to see coming out of the beer industry, and that is bridging that gap into spirits. We've heard for a long time, you know, beer is at war with spirits and wine and whatever. And to a certain degree, that's true. But if you've noticed, a lot of breweries across this country are diversifying their portfolios by adding on distillery attachments to their mainline product. Uh, we got Avondale down in Alabama. I think Three Floyds has a, a distilling division and New Holland, of course, you know, they have theirs and now I, we're, we're seeing paps. And we've seen in the past where Big Beer has been dipping their toes into the spirit world. We know that AB Bev owns some distilleries. We know that Constellation Brands owns a, a whole bunch of hard liquor lines. And uh, we've even seen Budweiser, you know, start releasing some barrel aged products. So uh, once again, I do think this is the natural progression for the beer industry. I think we're going to start seeing a lot more merging and a lot more breweries branching into this as beer sales are going to continue to decline. So it's all very interesting. Definitely let me know what you think about this. Are you excited to try Pabst Whiskey? I am a little bit, not going to lie to you. Additionally, if there is any brewery out there that you would like to see start making craft spirits, what would it be? I'm very interested. All right, so this last story is a bit of a weird one. Coming out of New Orleans, as you know, this week is all about Mardi Gras and everyone's you know, going crazy on Bourbon Street and there's a little bit of a dispute going on with the beer on Bourbon Street. So if you've ever been to Bourbon Street, you know that everybody walking up and down pretty much has one of four drinks in their hands and it's pretty much the same for every person drinking on there. You've got the slushies that have become so popular there. You've got the hand grenades, which is basically a New Orleans staple at this point. You have those little neon tubes of just hard liquor that girls just come up and shove in your mouth. And then you have the big fucking cups of beer, the massive ones. And the original, the OG of those big beers is none other than the huge ass beer cup. Huge ass beer is greatly upset at giant ass beer. <laughs> it was announced earlier this week that huge ass beer was going to be suing several bars and clubs up and down Bourbon Street because of copyright infringement. Where they have their huge ass beer, we are starting to see the emergence of cups bearing the name of giant ass beer and huge ass beer didn't like people stepping on their territory like that. Huge ass beer claims that it is copyright infringement 
And it says restraining order, but I think what they're talking about is a cease and desist to stop selling big format beer cups to go. And it also states that they are seeking uh, unspecified amount of damages caused by the confusion and tarnishing of their brand name. And unfortunately, that's all the information we really have so far. Both parties are not really wanting to talk about it. They haven't been responding to uh, all the news agencies that have been seeking more information. So that's about where we are with that. But I do have some thoughts. When I was reading this story, I couldn't help but thinking there's two equally important parts of this. One, I do think there is some validity to it. And two, I do think it's incredibly dumb. On the side of validity, yes, huge ass beer is obviously having their style bitten and huge ass beer is obviously right on their dicks and right on their coattails trying to make some money off of a well-established New Orleans staple, really. So as far as that goes, I kind of get it. I kind of, you know, nobody wants to do something and then have someone else come in and do the same thing and try to take away from what you had built. But at the same time, there eventually gets to a point where the lines are so blurred that it's kind of just free game. As I mentioned earlier, I was talking about the hand grenade. The hand grenade, as I said, is a New Orleans staple. It is one of the things that if you go to New Orleans and you're on Bourbon Street, you have to get one. It's just, it's mandatory. They're delicious. But two, every single place says they have the original hand grenade or they have the best hand grenade or whatever. It's gotten to the point where it doesn't really matter who the original is. It's just a New Orleans thing. And I hate to say it, so is the big ass beer cup to go because I mean that's just what it is. You're not you're not making your own beer and putting it in there. It's just you're taking someone else's beer. I was there like a year ago and it was Yingling, Bud Light, and I think one other offering, and they just poured into a big cup. You know, that's all it is. And I think having a trademark around that concept is a bit of a stretch. The bite of the name, sure, but the concept. So I know copyright law can be a bit confusing and there's like a whole lot of layers and things that go into it. And I do believe that you have the right to protect, you know, your ideas and your business policies and all that stuff. I just, I don't know, this situation's got me weirded out. I just feel it's a bit strange that there's so much going on about a cup pipe. You don't own a copyright on big cups. Anyways, that's pretty much all I wanted to talk about this week. Just a couple little weird little stories like that. So thank you very much for watching, everybody. I really hope you enjoyed. Like, comment, subscribe. Remember that there's a story in every bottle and that life is brutal. Cheers.